you know, about a, a good hand span part is good. You know, all this cardboard will break down. You notice here I'm not hearing about big chunks and big pieces and that sort of thing. That doesn't matter. Hey, it's Greg here and I'm out here in the garden. It's fall, it's uh, late, late, almost the end of October. And I'm dealing with uh, a problem garden. So this garden is, and by problem I mean things don't grow well in it, and it's kind of shady, and it tends to get a lot of weeds. And uh, I got a great idea for solving this problem gardening, and that's kind of giving up on it in a certain kind of sense, okay? Not completely giving up, but giving up on treating it like a normal garden. It just can't be a normal garden because it's in this terrible spot. Why is it a terrible spot? Well, that direction is south and uh, that direction is west. And there's trees over there and there's trees over there. So, I mean, it's the trees shade the sun, you know, especially in the spring and the fall, the sun's at an angle, right? Right now the sun is like on a 45 degree angle. It's in the south. Um, it's in the southeast right now, right? But it's not straight up overhead, it's on an angle. And because of that, all the trees that surround my garden, surrounded by a forest, all the trees, especially at an angle, they create a lot of shade. So this garden is always, I mean, it gets some direct light, but it, you know, it doesn't consistently get six or especially eight hours of sunlight. To have a good garden, you want to have like six hours of direct sunlight, ideally eight, ideally more, right? Direct sunlight. And I'm talking about where I live in Nova Scotia, Canada, uh, zone six, uh, kind of foggy, kind of overcast a lot. So, you know, some people say, well, shady spots are great if you're in Arizona. Yeah, I'm not in Arizona, right? So, I mean, there's, there's different rules for different growing zones if you're in Texas or someplace like that where it's just ridiculously hot. There's a time of the year when it's so hot, almost nothing can grow unless it's in the shade, right? Uh, but where I live, shade is just, it's, it's practically useless for a vegetable gardener. There are things that will grow in shade, um, but there's so many weeds that are better at growing in shade than the vegetables. I mean, so you can grow things like, I'm starting to ramble on here, but the, I'm just anticipating all the questions that people are going to ask. You can grow things like spinach and lettuce, arugula, for instance, at the, height, at, at the height of the summer in shade. They don't mind that because they don't like too much heat. They don't like too much sun. Even in a climate like mine, you can do that. But there's a couple hundred weeds that just exist in the soil, right? Your soil has what's called a soil seed bank. There's seeds, there's weed seeds in your soil all the time. Long way of saying, yes, there are vegetables you can grow in the shade, but there are so many native or invasive weeds that are just around that this, the seeds literally float in out of the sky that are so much better at growing in shade, right? Especially there's certain plants that sort of creep so 1% or maybe 80% of the, the weed is uh, relatively tall and it's getting lots of sun and it's sending all these like, you know, either roots out or even like branches out and it's just spreading. And so the one, there's one part of the plant that's getting all the sun that's sort of like a mother and everything else going out is like an umbilical cord. So even though the, the main plant is sending, sending appendages of itself, into this sort of crappy shady spot. The whole plant as a whole system is getting plenty of sun energy from the sun because it's got this big part that's in the sun. A good example of that is uh, wild strawberries, which I have a real problem with in my garden. They see, I mean, like the whole garden has a fence around it and beyond the fence, there's bushes, weeds, and trees and forest. And uh, there's a number of very prevalent weeds in that mess. Um, and one of them, one's a blackberry, I got a particular kind of wild blackberry. People love blackberries, but blackberry I have here is like tiny, tiny little berries. And uh, it doesn't really grow up, it grows horizontally. And it grows underground and it's, it makes a terrible mess of everything. It's very hard to keep out of the garden. And another big problem is um, a wild strawberry, which I mean, I just, I just spent about 15 minutes uh, pulling everything out of this garden and throwing it in the woods. But I must, I pulled handful after handful after handful of wild strawberry out of here, right? Because strawberry, the, the plant sort of grows, 
and then it sends out a what's that called a, a runner and that starts another plant and then the runner sends out another plant another plant right and some people say yeah but wild strawberries oh they're so sweet they're so good blah 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 well, all that's true but you know i grow like strawberry cultivars in my garden big fat juicy delicious red strawberries i got no time for little teeny tiny wild strawberries that just create a weed problem in my garden uh, you know those are if you're out foraging in the woods trying to survive and you find some wild strawberries great uh, but in a vegetable garden i don't really think they're worth your while anyway i'm getting way off topic let's get back focused on what we're doing here i got this garden that is consistently inundated with weeds what I'm trying to grow in it is these Egyptian walking onions and they do okay right but the thing was so inundated with weeds it was a problem a particular problem is this last so we get the whole garden here this is a small garden this is like four by three okay because it's just a small little bed in a shady corner of the garden where you know I'm growing something that I use right these Egyptian walking onions right you they grow a kind of onion you can use like a, like a shallot um, but they also grow these um, what's the name people use for these? I can't remember. It's not coming to mind. But anyway, these greens. You can use these just like you would any sort of green onion, right? Um, so they're handy and they, they grow in the spring and they grow in the fall and they grow in the summer and you just have a steady source. Scallions. Or you have a steady source. I think that's the right term. You have a steady source of, of sta scallions, green onions, and you've got these little kind of shallot-like bulbs. I don't know if there's any over here to show you. Yeah, like, like this one here. It's shallot-like. Right? I mean, this one's starting to grow, but you can use these bulbs. And they have a stronger taste than an onion, but a weaker taste than garlic. Like a shallot. Very similar. Uh, anyway, that's the intent of this garden, because uh, I don't need an incredible amount of these. They're, they're not as useful as, like, cooking onions. Uh, but they're nice to have whenever you need something like this for a a stir fry or an omelet or whatever you just got them I and I like to have about a bed for me for the amount I use them a bed about this size it's all that's needed and the fact that it's not a sort of an ideal uh, great bed in terms of weeds and stuff like that or in terms of productivity right this is a shady bed so it's not a great bed it doesn't matter because I don't need a, I just need whenever I'm cooking and I need these I've got them right but there's enough here for what I use them for Okay, so I'm going to put another row here and another row here. What I'm going to put in this bed is, is three rows and mulch in between the rows. But you'll notice over here I've dug down. I don't know how you can tell this, but I've, I've dug down about six inches. Right, and i just thrown the earth up there. And I've, I basically dug this, this end part out. Because this is the worst part of the garden. Nothing grows here. Well, I mean... Weeds grow here. <laughs> Weeds creep in from outside the fence. It's so shady. Any plant I put here uh, performs very poorly. It doesn't put on a lot of growth. It doesn't do well. You can almost see, I don't know how obvious it is, but there's shade there. You know, it's just a perfect time of day to do this. And it's around 1030 in the morning. There's shade there. And over here we've got some sun, right? So when I was saying in the beginning of the video, about giving up, I've just decided, like, why am I trying so hard to get things to grow in a corner of this corner of this bed where they just won't grow? What I need here is something like a weed barrier, right? Also, I think I can create a weed barrier that also doubles as a habitat for toads, garter snakes, salamanders. <laughs> All those wonderful beneficials that are in the garden. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. So what I thought I would do was just get all the good soil out of there. Give up on it sort of thing. Now I got some old nasty cardboard leaf bags and stuff, right? Throw these down. There's the rest of this stuff here. Yeah, this will do. Like a weed barrier, a biodegradable weed barrier. It's just old cardboard. This will break down eventually, right? It's just been sitting out in the rain, right? Getting all nasty. Throw that down. 
Now, got some old logs and stuff. All right, throw those there. And I got some, uh, just some wood that was completely rotten on the property that I just smashed up with a with an axe about an hour ago. Right. I'll just throw that there. And this will make this nice sort of, you know, toad, garter snake, etc. habitat. Hopefully, I mean, I imagine there's still some kind of weeds. I, I, I can still see raspberry blackberry finding a way to poke up through this, right? But maybe I only have to do this uh, once a year. This sort of thing. That's probably enough. Something like that. All this junk over here. And this all just break down. Yeah, that sort of thing. All right, so now this end of the garden where the weeds were the worst, look, there's another wild strawberry. Look at the roots on that. So this end of the garden where the where the weeds were so bad is basically kind of weed, somewhat weed proof, right? Now I can plant some of these uh, Egyptian walking onions. I mean, they've already started rooting. This is a little bit, really, you want to plant these in uh, in uh, October. Um, so it's a little bit late, but these things are they're bloody invincible. So let, let me show you what I'm doing here. So spacing is important. I think, you know, about a, a good hand span apart is good. These plants are very tough. I find with the roots, you just sort of fan them out a bit. Like that. Should be okay. All right. They're a pretty tough plant. You get... The plant makes these at some point in the summer, almost like a bulbul. Right? Never flowers, it just makes new babies, right? So, I mean, you can give these away to your friends and be a nice person, that sort of thing. You're, you're always going to have more, way more than you need, right? I usually, um, once a year, I usually put a bucket load of these out on, in, at the end of the, my driveway and implore neighbors, and I'll just say, free walking onions, you know, and, uh, you know, some of them will take them. I mean, it amazes me how few people do gardening. And especially it's a shame where I live because everybody on my street has a, like an acre and a half of land. You know, that's what I have. Some of them have more than that. So it just seems, I mean, as soon as I became something resembling a landowner, um, I had a garden. <laughs> I didn't waste any time. I said, okay, I'm paying for this land. I'm putting a garden in right now. now. I'm planting a lot of these because I don't know if some of them will fail or not, right? And I'm going to mulch this when I'm done too. I'll do the whole thing here on the camera. All right, so I got one row in there. You know, I'll just measure out another hand span. I should give you a good, get a row here and a row here right against the wood. That should be all right. I got plenty of these seeds. So, uh, now see, here's another bulbul with little tiny ones, right? So there's really not really worth investing. I mean, and these things are so tough. You just throw them somewhere in there. I've had them fall and land on the sand in my walking paths and root anyway, right? They're extremely um, tough little plants, the Egyptian walking onion. I don't know anything about the origin of these, but I would bet real money that they have nothing to do with Egypt at all because they can handle a Canadian winter. <laughs> so I think it's got something to do with, you know, the the way they the way they seed themselves. They go up and they go over and they go up and they go over. So it's kind of like, you know, walk like an Egyptian, if you remember that bangle song from the 80s. <laughs> right? So I think I think that's what it is. I don't know for sure. I'm sure someone will say something 
in the comments and clear this all up because uh, there's always someone that knows everything. <laughs> there's always plenty of people know more than me. What I do know is that these are an incredibly tough, resilient, hardy plant. Look at the roots on these. You want to spread these out, see? You don't want to have them all balled up. That's pretty good. And one spot over there. I'm just sorting through. I have, a, I have a huge mess of bulbals just off to the side, okay? So I'm just sorting through them to find the biggest and the best. Like that. Now you plant these in the fall, you know, around the same time you might plant garlic. Um, most of my garlic are in already. And in fact, it's been so damn warm that uh, and it's a shame, but a lot of my garlic already uh, shot up, starting to grow, which I don't want this time of year. But um, anyway, so we'll just get a few more, sift through, find the, the nicer ones, the bigger ones. The bigger the better. Um, I find these plants to be, here's a nice big one. I find these to be pretty pest free. I mean, I think some people are going to say you, you put all this stuff in your garden, so you're going to get, um, you're going to get cell bugs, you're going to get pill bugs, you're going to get whatever those things are called, right? And uh, yeah, in fact, when I was busting up the logs that these came out of, there was hundreds of pill bugs in them. And uh, there's pill bugs everywhere in my garden, wherever I, pill bugs love mulch. So I have pill bugs everywhere in my garden, but I think the concern about them is misplaced. I mean, pill bugs eat decaying plant matter. They're kind of like worms in that sense, right? They're, they're more beneficial than problematic. They will eat vegetation, but from everything I have read, it's not their preference, right? The preference is decaying plant matter. It's almost like it's like human beings can eat raw food, but we, we kind of prefer, generally speaking, except for people on certain fad diets and stuff, um, I think human beings prefer cooked food, right? I mean, as soon as, I think as soon as we discovered fire, we're like, and someone cooked some meat or, or even a root vegetable, anything over a fire, they're like, holy smokes, that's the real deal right there, man. Give me more of that, right? Um, so I think it's the same thing with them. I mean, they can eat vegetation, but um, they can eat raw vegetables, right? Certain kinds, I suppose. But I think they prefer decaying plant matter. I think it's just easier for them to digest, and they've just, just evolved to have a preference for that. So it's my understanding and my experience, because I have pill bugs, sow bugs, whatever those things are called, everywhere in my garden and I've, I've never found them to be a problem in terms of like you know defoiling you know wrecking plants and what i've read is that as long as they as long as your gardens are kept mulched they really don't they just focus on eating the decaying mulch and they really leave your vegetative growth alone because it's not what they like so uh to that effect let's get a mulch on this garden here now I got some um, a source of wood chips that I'm going to put down, but just because I got this, this has been sort of blowing around the garden. Got some old cardboard, so I thought I'd put that between the rows. Oh, there's a nice one. Stick that in there too. You notice, like in the rows, I've got them. Some of them. Some of them. Um, there's a spot here. Planted about three inches away from each other. That's fine. Right, you can totally get away with that. That'll work. Right? Got spaces between the rows. All right, there we go. All right, so I get this, this nasty old cardboard. Throw that between the rows. All right? That will help. It just seems unbelievably warm this fall. I can't believe how warm it is. I mean, it's very, it's concerning, right? You don't, I do not want my falls to be this warm. 
it's getting we've had some nights where it's gotten down to zero we've had frost but it's certainly not as cold as it would normally be and by normal i mean every october november of my entire life living here that that kind of normal <laughs> okay everything i've ever seen in my life right so yeah i don't know where all that's going but i don't like it uh, anyway i'll put this cardboard down here Trying to leave just enough room so that the uh, onions can see see daylight, right? Get up through. You know, all this cardboard will break down. It'll all just get eaten by the worms and the pill bugs and everything else, right? So it doesn't matter that I'm leaving it here. Someone always asks about the ink. My understanding is the ink's made from vegetable, from plant, plant-based ink, so I don't worry about it being toxic or whatever. Um, but uh, some people worry more than others. I'm not. I don't worry about stuff. I mean, if I have a concern, I'll look it up and uh, you know make an evidence-based decision whether it's worth continuing to worry. I'm, <coughs> I'm not worried about the plant-based dye in these leaf bags. All right, there's that. Now we need something to hold that down. All right, so this is just one of these old fireman's axes, you know, firefighter axe. And I got some old rotten wood here. A little bit of work. But not much to smash that all up, right? Some pieces here. It doesn't matter that it's in big chunks for what we're using it for here. Okay, so just holding that cardboard down, it'll continue to break down and decompose, right? It's a great thing if you got trees on your property, there's always some wood breaking down, there's always something in the process of decay that you can. You can use, you know, that was not rotten enough. Yeah. And just in case we don't have enough, let's grab another big piece over here. Yeah. There we go. Have that or you notice I don't use the blade, I use that thing on the back. So the blade stays somewhat sharp. And I find these firefighter axes great for a lot of gardening chores. I like a pickaxe, but a bit lighter and a bit more uh, axy, if that's a word. And I use a lot of rotten wood like this in the garden. It only takes a minute to uh, to prepare. I'm not sure it's all work, but there's all kinds of people just, you know, practically running on hamster wheels in gymnasiums all around the world. To me, that's a waste of time. This is productive exercise. All right, let's get that over into the garden. All right, so now we're just adding this rotten wood to hold the paper in place. Just so that it doesn't move, so that it's, you know, blocking the, the Egyptian walking onions from the sun. All right, brings the profile of the paper down turns that paper into a proper mulch. This will all break down very slowly. Now people might ask or say, isn't all that wood chip going to uh, deplete the nitrogen in your soil? 
And the answer is yes, but not in a way that matters. Okay. <laughs> yes, but. Um, so decaying, you know, you got something like a you know half rotten piece of wood. It's mostly carbon, doesn't have a lot of nitrogen. So in order for it to break down, in order for the soil organisms to break it down, they need to pull nitrogen out of the soil um, to do that. Right. Um, but they're only going to take nitrogen out of the soil that's in contact with the paper and the wood chips and stuff. So they're not going to be going down deep into the soil, right, stripping all the nitrogen out of the soil. They're just going to be using whatever nitrogen's available in the soil that's in contact with the material that's being broken down. So the plant roots go much deeper than that, right? So it's not going to be a problem for these for these Egyptian walking onions, right? And there can be a problem when you've got seedlings and the seedlings, you know, you've planted seeds, you've sown seeds and they have very shallow roots and they're using the very, very top surface of the soil and they need nitrogen to grow well, especially at that early stage of their development. And you've got some sort of mulch right on the surface of the soil, right next to all of that, right? And, and that is pulling, depleting, decreasing the nitrogen in the soil. Yes, that's when that's when you have that's when you have created a problem. A little bit, a little bit between these. Basically, I want these little greens poking out from between the wood chips so they can get they can get sun, right? But I want all the soil covered with this stuff. And I want the paper kind of covered too. So it's almost like doing a mosaic. I mean, this seems like a bit of work. It's taking a bit of time. But the result of this work is, will be, uh, hopefully, <laughs> a very low maintenance garden next year, right? Very low maintenance garden. No, I mean, all this uh, leaf bag paper that I've got down here, it's, I mean, that, that'll all, I don't know if it'll be broken down before freeze up, because, I mean, we're already getting nights that are at zero. Um, but, suffice it to say, let's say by sometime in April or May, all, all this paper will be gone, okay? Look, there's still a couple weeds there. Yeah, all that paper will be gone. But hopefully, you know, I'll have enough of this wood chip stuff to really keep the sun off the soil. Be a good weed barrier. Right? And I can always replenish it, you know, as things progress. Right? That's always an option. You notice here I'm not caring about big chunks and big pieces and that sort of thing. That doesn't matter. I mean, people might have seen the documentary, like the Back to Eden documentary, and become obsessed with having these sort of like perfect wood chips. Um, I mean, those sorts of things might matter in an ornamental garden, right? But when you're a vegetable gardener, what you're looking for is results, function, efficiency. Right, so there's these big chunks are totally fine. In fact, they take so they take a long time to break down, so they work good, right? And to me, to me, they look good anyway, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I like the look of them, but I mean, I'm using them because I've. I've got them, <laughs> right? They're free. They cost nothing. I've got them. So yeah, just uh, messing around in the gardening on a Sunday morning. I got a little bed here with some Egyptian walking onions. 
and uh, you know I've had success with it but not it's not been low maintenance the way I want so you know I invest about 20 30 minutes of my time in it right now in, in late October and uh, this should be relatively weed free next spring I've taken the part of the bed that's unproductive and just made it productive in a different way I've turned it into a weed barrier which is productive for me because I hate weeding I've also turned it into a habitat for beneficials worms, salamanders, toads, garter snakes garter snakes love a wood pile like that I mean sure some ants and pill bugs and things like that might get in there as well but I'm not too worried about that everything seems to work itself out for the most part with with the exception of sometimes when I get fire ants um, but um, otherwise I don't really have too many problems so uh, anyway I thought I'd just take you through that process um, and maybe you get some ideas from that and kind of helps you solve a problem you've got. I hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast at maritimegardening.com. Check out my weekly column at maritimegardening.substack.com. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.